If someone says we can't do something, then that's when we start doing it. Be alive in this day and age. Grasp the values that are there, grasp the opportunities and go for them. Try to be positive and enjoy. And love, love your neighbor as yourself. Hello and welcome to Elder Wisdom, stories from the Green Bench. My name is Erin Davis and I'll be joined shortly by Doug Robinson, my 87-year-old co-host who lives at Sandalwood Park in Brampton. It's just one of the many Schlegel Village's retirement and long-term care residences and this podcast is the brainchild of the Schlegel family. It's long been patriarch Ron Schlegel's belief that, and I quote, The greatest untapped resource in Canada, if not the world, is the collective wisdom of our elders. Well, today we get to mine those resources and share the perspective and many facets of a fascinating individual, Dr. Bob Bell, a McGill University grad. You'll soon hear how that changed the path of his life. Dr. Bell has more degrees than my oven. But you may know his name from his years as Deputy Minister of Health and Long-Term Care in Ontario until 2018, or as an author of medical-based thriller fiction and an expert on health care for an aging population. He joins Doug Robinson and me here today. Oh, Doug, it's so lovely to hear your voice again, and thank you, thank you for making Dr. Bell feel so welcome here on the Green Bench. But I have to warn you, You remember that when we had on the former governor general, you had to pay a fine every time you called him by his honorific? You're not allowed to call Dr. Bell Dr. Bell. I'm not allowed to. No, he he has to be Bob. He's got to be Bob. Is it Bob? It's Bob. Okay, Bob. All right. So without (laughs) any further ado, the doctor is in. Welcome, Dr. Bob Bell. And we'll call you Bob from here on in, okay? Thanks very much, Aaron. In fact, if Doug calls me Dr. Bell, it means that he wants me to operate on him, which would be a big mistake on his part at this point. (laughs) Well, certainly virtually it would be, although that would be interesting. We can do it long distance, but it's not going to be pretty. (laughs) So how is it that, Dr. Bell, Bob, you came here from Wales as a child and have no accent? And our friend Doug here sounds like he just got off the flight from England. How is that? (laughs) Off the boat, indeed. I obviously had remedial lessons when I was four years old when I arrived here. I got a sense, Doug, you arrived a little later than that, didn't you? He did. He did. You were some 53 years ago that you came to Canada, right, Doug? 1969. I had two small children, one three-year-old and one two-year-old. Well, you learned how to talk the wrong way before you got here, and it's been hard for you to unlearn, right? I have to tell you this one, Bob. We arrived on February the 1st, minus 24 degrees. I, I went out shopping to get the milk and shopping and everything, came out of the store, stood on the side of the road waiting for the streetcar to come along. The streetcar came along. I was standing on the wrong side of the road. Of course you were. Of course. (laughs) I'm looking looking right and the streetcar came left. (laughs) Thank God it wasn't cold that day anyway. Oh, no. No, minus 24 (laughs) <laughs> Gee, just an average day. I'm, yeah. Yeah, no kidding. So you have had a very interesting life and career, Dr. Bell. Let's go back a little beyond when you came to Canada from Wales at age five to your years at McGill, where you actually crossed paths with one of our former guests from episode 29, Dr. Ray Brown. And you were both fine young strapping athletes from what i understand or you can go ahead and embellish whatever you want because we're not going to correct you dr brown ray as we love to call him was uh, a little older at that point than i am he was a young strapping athlete several years before i tried to emulate that uh he's a similar to me a surgeon and was one of the best teachers that all of us had when we were in mcgill medical school So, uh, yeah, McGill was a great place to go to school and certainly lots of history and healthcare and medicine, lots of history and football as well. 
If I recall correctly, he chose getting into medicine as a way to deal with a sibling's illness. But your path into work with bones and interest in medicine actually happened because of an injury out on the gridiron. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, yeah. So I had uh, an injury to my knee while I was uh, playing ball. And of course, back in those days, this would be at the, in the early 1970s, we didn't understand the knee as well as we do today. You remember incredible athletes way beyond my skills like Bobby Orr. Mm. His career was ended early by ligament injuries to his knee that ended up in, in arthritis. And I had an injury that in retrospect was clearly an anterior cruciate ligament injury. We, You know that term because you see it in the paper all the time about football players and hockey players injuring their anterior cruciate ligaments. So I had that injury. It wasn't recognized. And that led to some arthritis in my knee. It led to an interest in how knees and bones and joints worked. And it eventually, unfortunately, led to a knee replacement. But that also taught me just how good knee replacements are. Do you mean that facetiously or sincerely? Was it kind of rudimentary, the knee replacement in the 70s? Fortunately, the injury in the 70s led to a knee replacement three years ago. So, oh, so, so okay. I have full benefit of all the research and learning that's gone on in the last 50 years, uh, Aaron. And, uh, you know, as many of your listeners will know who've had their hips and their knees replaced, uh, you know, it's a remarkable outcome. I'm fortunate in having a superb surgeon at University Health Network in Toronto and uh, Dr. Davey did a spectacular job replacing my knee. You have also had a fascination or certainly an admiration for a young man who had bone difficulties of the worst kind. And we're talking about Terry Fox and his marathon of hope as he was crossing Canada with that one prosthetic leg in 1980 to 81. Tell us about your connection and your admiration for Terry Fox, would you, Dr. Bell? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, my connection, like most Canadians' connection, was simply to watch in absolute admiration and wonderment at what Terry was completing. Uh, Have you ever run a marathon, Aaron or Doug? Have you guys ever run a marathon? No, no. I love running, but I could never do a marathon. No, and I only run my mouth, so no. (laughs) So I've run three marathons, and each time I was utterly disabled for a week afterward, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Harry was running a marathon a day on an artificial leg. Yeah. And, you know, and apart from being an incredible feat with the inspiration he provided to so many Canadians, including me, And the money that he raised and his memory continues to raise through the Terry Fox Foundation every year. In addition to that incredible outcome, Terry was simply an extraordinary athlete doing a marathon a day on an artificial leg. You know, nobody has done that on two good legs, let alone on one. So he had, you know, a tremendous respect from everybody in Canada that was watching him. I I was actually doing orthopedic training, orthopedic residency, as we call it, at Mount Sinai Hospital at the time. And, of course, Terry ran down University Avenue, headed for City Hall Mm -hmm. the day that he came into town. And we were sort of, you know, cheering him on, standing alongside University Avenue at the time. Um, And at that time, I was actually learning about doing bone cancer surgery Uh, went to Boston subsequently to learn how to treat the kinds of tumors that Terry had, because at that time, the only way you could treat children and young adults with this terrible bone cancer was to do an amputation. So I went to Boston to learn some of the earlier research about how you could remove the cancer without removing the leg or the arm and brought that therapy back to Canada. And, uh, you know, it's advanced here quite dramatically. In fact, we've trained over 70 surgeons that have gone back to America, to Europe, to Asia, to Australia, New Zealand. Uh, Toronto has turned into a real kind of center for bone cancer and muscle cancer surgery. So, you know, I'm happy to be able to tell you that the treatment for children, young adults who have Terry Fox tumors is much, much better than it was back in the 
tragic days when, of course, Terry died from his cancer. That still happens occasionally, but nowhere near as often as it used to, thanks to advances in treatment. A very inspiring chapter in this chat that we're having here. And not only that, you share Terry's birthday. You know, I didn't know that. Wow. Little Bird, our tremendous producer, Melinda, tells us July 28th. Is that right? That is correct for me. And is that also Terry's birthday? I had no idea of that. <laughs> I have, you know, talked to the Fox family, writing a, I wrote a textbook at one point on bone cancers and uh, asked the family if I could dedicate it to Terry and they kindly agreed. But I did not know that uh, we had the same birthday. So there you go. Thank you, Aaron. Yes, July 28th, 1958, and uh, he died June 28th, 1981. Far too young. So am I extrapolating from this that Canada has become sort of a hub, if you will, a a high point for bone cancer and orthopedic oncology, perhaps because of Terry Fox? Because I know we see these runs and there will be another one, well, several coming up across the country next month in September. And people will say, well, okay, but where does all the money go? Is this is this something we can pinpoint, doctor? Is this something we can say, yes, here, here's why you register. Here's why you pledge. Here's why you help in the Terry Fox runs. Aaron, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, uh, I, I can honestly say that there's nowhere in the world where people will get better care for bone cancers, for muscle cancers than here in Canada. Uh, there are excellent surgeons and medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, coast to coast. And there's also been a tremendous amount of research done on how these bone cancers develop, improvements in treatment for them. Uh, and that's where that money goes. You know, it's not just for bone cancer. Of course, research in Canada and breast cancer and colon cancer in the full gamut of cancers that are so tragic for so many Canadians. Research is the way that these cancers get better treatment and in many cases get cured. And that research is really well supported by the Terry Fox Foundation. And uh, every year, all us runners who go out there and raise money and do their kilometers, they're contributing to future cures for cancer. Goodness, it is indeed inspiring. And as I look at Terry's date of birth, 1958, he would be 64. So let us talk now about our aging population. And I know that, Doug, of course, you have a vested interest in this. So go ahead, my friend. Yes, uh, Dr. Bell, I'm reading the uh, book Maple Ridge. Ah, wonderful. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) And if there's any listeners out there who like to read... I can highly recommend Dr. Bell's book. It's called Maple Ridge by Dr. Bell. And if you'd like to purchase it, (laughs) go to drbell.com and the money received from this book goes to the Care Research of UHN Foundation. Doug, thank you for that pitch. It's called actually New Dock in Maple Ridge. Just and you can get it. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Amazon, wherever you buy your books, or you can go to my website, drbobbell.com, as Doug kindly mentioned. And, uh, you know, this this is a hobby. Since I stopped being deputy minister for Ontario, one of the things that I've taken up is uh, creative fiction writing and have published to this point two books. Um, the first was called hip. I had that too. We weren't talking about, you know, the tragically hip or being hip. We were talking about your hip joint and what can happen if nefarious people try to improve the amount of profit they make from selling hip joints without being absolutely honest about their research. So these are medical thrillers. These are fiction. If you've had a hip joint, you don't have to worry. There's nothing dangerous that's happened. (laughs) <laughs> you can imagine a fictional story that can derive from imaginary stories about nefarious scientists trying to make more money out of better hip joints. So that's what hip's about. And New Doc in Maple Ridge is also a thriller. It's about what happens when a doc with a rather mysterious background arrives in the small community of Maple Ridge, Arkansas. And as Doug mentioned, you know, uh, all 
proceeds from these books uh, go to support medical research. In this case, at University Health Network for a new doc from Maple Ridge. And in the case of uh, HIP, it supports actually research in bone cancers at Princess Margaret Hospital. Where did you get the inspiration for the characters? Well, you know, most of them are true. I mean, there are experiences that I've had in a variety of ways in healthcare delivery. I'll give you an example. May I, Aaron, give an example? Oh, absolutely. Well, just imagine this. When I was in practice as a general doctor, before I went into orthopedic surgery, I was working as a general practitioner in a small town just outside Brampton. And I was looking after uh, a family, mainly seeing, always seeing a mother and her two children. And the mother seemed to be kind of chronically depressed, wasn't happy with life, seemed kind of beaten down, never met her husband. And one day her husband came in and it turned out, I think I can say this on the green bench, he had a case of venereal disease. Can I say this? You may. You're a doctor. You can say anything. So he'd been away on a quote unquote golfing trip with his buddies. <laughs> with venereal disease. And of course, I asked him, you know, have you given it to your wife? And he said, yes, absolutely. I need you to treat me and I need you to treat her. But you can't tell her what you're (laughs) treating her. (laughs) This is rather tense because, of course, there's no way in the world you could give someone treatment without telling them what it's for. So I tried to explain medical ethics to him, and he insisted that he wanted me to do what he was asking me to do. And then I subsequently discovered that he was a bit of a bad guy. And he wasn't beyond trying to intimidate his doctor to do what he wanted him to do. So anyway, the story ended up okay in the end, but it was a bit tense for a while. But, you know, Doug, as you read through New Doc and Maple Ridge, you'll see that story as one of the fundamental drivers of the novel. Do me a favor. Yeah. (laughs) Bob, who calls you Elvis? And where did the nickname come from? Well, that is actually uh, my grandson. Our oldest grandson, Giacomo, used to, uh, you know, look at a uh, cartoon that included his character, my character, Elvis. And we used to play, of course, as you do with your grandchildren. And we used to play a variety of games, one of which I used to be Elvis, which was not the not the Elvis Presley. Yeah. Rather, it was Elvis the fireman. So... <laughs> Oh, the fireman. fireman. Oh, okay. Sam was the name of the uh, cartoon that we were playing. And Jack Moe would always be the key character, Fireman Sam. And I was his trusty sidekick, Elvis. So, you know, he would drive the story, just uh, talking about driving again. And I would play along and go as he wanted me to go. And we would have hours of fun playing Fireman Sam. There you go. Now you know. Thank you, Bob. You have had such a widespread and awesome career, really. I mean, when your grandkids grow up and they look back at what grandpa did in his life to go from a career as a family doctor, ER doctor, cancer surgeon, hospital CEO and deputy minister of health in Ontario. And of course, published author and published in the Globe and Mail just a couple of months ago, May 13th, there was an article about aging and long term health care. Let's talk about that last entry into your resume, because you are, as you described yourself, a healthcare guy. You've worked in Ontario healthcare for 45 years in a variety of roles, so committed to our healthcare system in Ontario. So let's talk about our population, 75 and older, increasing at 4% per year. Where do you see us going in terms of how the whole system should be heading, Dr. Bell, professionally, and as someone who is easing into that demographic himself? Yeah, you know, uh, that's a great question, Aaron. And, you know, uh, we are in this interesting, uh, what scientists call the demographic bulge, right? Mm -hmm. Us baby boomers who are causing, you know, all kinds of agitation in terms of where our health system is going. Because as you describe it, people over the age of 75 are increasing at 4%, sometimes above 4% per year as the baby boomers reach their golden years. 
And of course, that causes concern about, first of all, how we're going to care for all these people. Secondly, how we're going to afford it. And thirdly, will that crowd out other spending? And, you know, you know, especially after the effect of this pandemic, that we've got a lot of work to do, that the impact of the pandemic on people living in long-term care homes across, across Canada was really challenging. And we also know that, uh, you know, seniors want to be independent. They want to be looked after in the accommodation that they have chosen for themselves. They don't want to necessarily be in long-term care nursing homes unless they absolutely have to be. So if we have to have people in long-term care homes, we need to do a better job for them. We need to be able to provide from our tax dollars better staffing. We need to be able to ensure that people are in the wonderful kinds of accommodation that Schlegel Villages provide. I mean, my goodness gracious, you're talking from the green bench and many green benches around Schlegel Villages where the most up-to-date standards in long-term care and retirement living are observed. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Bob. Well, it's absolutely true. The way that uh, Schlegel Villages are organized and the facilities that are available for people there. But we have a lot of work to do in terms of bringing all our residential standards across the country up to a level that we can be proud of, rather than being frightened for people who are living in residences. And the challenge is that's going to cost money. And sometimes we think, well, that's going to take all the money from the system. Maybe we need to change our healthcare system, create a two-tiered system that has, you know, private funding for it. And I am absolutely convinced that's not the case. We can afford to care for our seniors in Canada. Uh, It's a 4% annual increase, but you know, it doesn't go on forever. And here's where I have to be kind of, you know, sensitive to my future and Dove's future, because we both feel like we're going to live forever. But of course, we won't. And this demographic bulge, the rise in the number of seniors accelerates up to 2031, and then it starts to decelerate for reasons that we don't have to discuss, Doug. Right. And, you know, that means that we have to make an investment, but that investment is time limited. We can afford it. We can afford it. Canada is a wealthy country. We can afford to do much better with our seniors, not only with improving long-term care, but also improving home care and the kind of care that you know, comes into your home wherever you've decided to live. So there are many things we can do. It will cost more money, but there are so many things we can also do to make healthcare and Medicare in Canada more efficient, some of which we've been talking about in the Globe Mail and other places. There are lots of things that we can do to make Canadian Medicare faster and better and, you know, to be honest, cheaper. And we can afford to look after this time-limited number of seniors that are increasing in Canada. That's so true, Bob. That's so true. I'm a senior, and I thank you for what you just said about seniors needing more help. I thank you for that. Well, Doug, I'm not far behind you, so this is (laughs) self-interested conversation. Yeah. COVID's been a terrible thing, too. You know, I think we can be proud. We can be proud of the way our health system responded, you know, If you look at Canadian results from mortality during the pandemic, we actually did much better than the United States, much better than where you and I come from in the UK, Doug, much better than most of Western Europe. Uh, The thing that really distinguishes us on the bad side of the ledger, though, is that more than any other country in the world, we had the highest proportion of mortality occurring in our long-term care homes. So it's taught us we need to be thinking better about how we provide long-term care in this country. What is your hope for the future of the health care in Canada? Well, I guess I start off by saying that Canadians need to understand better the asset that we have in Medicare. Having practiced in the United States, I can tell you, being able to say to everybody in this country, you will receive care in hospitals, care from doctors based on your need for care and not based on your ability to pay, that is a very, very important statement. 
And I think Canadians, you know, don't always realize what that provides for us, because we not only get care based on our tax dollars, that's the same for everybody. But as I was saying about the treatment of Terry Fox tumors earlier, Aaron, we also get the best standard of care in the world. We often have frustrations about wait times, you know, how long it takes to see your primary care doctor, how long it takes to be referred to a specialist, how long we wait for surgery. Those wait times are frustrating for Canadians. There are things that we should be doing to improve those, some of which we've written about in the Globe and Mail in a series that's available on their website. Uh, Just look under Dr. Bob Bell or you can see it on drbobbell.com. It's all there. Um, And, you know, there are changes that we can make Where have you ever seen a fax except in a doctor's office in the last 10 years? Exactly. And at our pharmacy, it's like, it is unbelievable. Well, you know, the fact that we're still using faxes, it tells you that, first of all, we're not as safe as we should be because faxes Mm -hmm. get lost, faxes can be dropped on the floor, and we're also not as cost effective as we should be because when you're able to transmit digital information from the doctor's electronic health record to the pharmacist or to the consultant doctor, the specialist doctor that your family doctor wants to refer you to, that information gets there faster. And it also goes to the doctor that has the shortest waiting list. It gets digitally routed. Fax doesn't do that for you. You know, there's other things we can do. We know the backlog in surgeries that have resulted from COVID. Well, guess what? We could be doing 30% more surgery for the same amount of time and the same cost if we were to move surgeries out of hospitals and into community surgery clinics, which has happened in the United States. That is faster and it's cheaper, and we should be doing that. So there are things that we can be doing after COVID, and some of these lessons need to be learned and implemented. That's all in Maple Ridge, too. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much. And we'll give your books another plug because they're for such a good cause. And a great read, New Doc in Maple Ridge, which, of course, Doug is referencing there. And Hip, a novel, not about the tragically hip, but what could tragically go wrong if your hip replacement gets in the wrong hands. Oh, you've got it, Aaron. DrBobBell.com to learn more about them and the proceeds from the sales of both novels will go to charity. So we thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts and our knees and every other place in the joint for joining us today, Dr. Bell. It was enlightening, inspiring, and entertaining as heck. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Bob. It was an enlightening afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. We should tell you that Dr. Bell has a new book coming out in time for Christmas called Jonah K. Set in Canada, it's about an Indigenous doctor in James Bay who moves south to Toronto and finds himself working with a woman who experiences trials of her own. Find out more about Jonah K. Hip, a novel, and New Doc in Maple Ridge, all at Bob Bell's website, drbobbell.com. That's D-R-B-O-B-B-E-L-L dot com. I hope you'll join Doug and me next time as we talk with our guest about living with a spouse who has dementia, counting down to 2023, and going back four centuries in the family tree. Just subscribe for additional episodes, and that way you'll be notified as soon as they're up. Share your thoughts and opinions on social media using hashtag Elder Wisdom and help others find us on this green bench. If it's easier, just go to elderwisdom.ca to find the link. And please do rate the Elder Wisdom podcast and fill out the Elder Wisdom pledge. Thanks for that. In our next episode, Ivan Siriani joins us from London, Ontario. Ivan's going to be 93 in October, but is really excited about next year when he can move to the brand new village of Glendale Crossing and be closer to his wife, Marge. Ivan has a big trip planned this year. He's going to tell us about it, and I promise you will love our chat. On behalf of Doug Robinson, I'm Erin Davis, and your spot on the green bench is ready and waiting. Elder Wisdom, Stories from the Green Bench, is brought to you by Schlegel Villages, a complete continuum of care, offering independent living to long-term care, celebrating and honoring the wisdom of the elder. 
To learn more about us, please go to our website, schlegelvillages.com.